This is the truth about Mina Protocol. We're about to reveal some crazy facts about Mina that you haven't heard of. Welcome to The Bean Pod. This is your place for all things stocks and crypto. From beginner tips to expert picks, use this as fuel for your investing journey. Because when you're in the know, your money will grow. This episode of The Bean Pod is sponsored by KyberSwap. KyberSwap is a DEX and DEX aggregator, which is built to facilitate all your DeFi needs in one single platform. Fast, cheap, and safe. User experience is KyberSwap's sole focus to make everyone's life better in DeFi. Welcome to the Bean Pod. This is Shane, aka the Jolly Green Investor. And this is Josh, the Nifty Investor. Today, we're going to be revealing the truth about Mina Protocol. You may not have heard of this project, but after you revealed it some time ago in a tweet and in the Discord, and we started to dig a lot deeper into this project, holy shit, this is really cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, if you've been following us in the Discord, on our social media, Twitter, whatever, you would have noticed that we've um, we've frequently been posting about Mina both in you know what they're doing, what they're building, and we've got a lot of really cool things when you look under the hood of this project, so make sure to watch this episode to the end. If you caught our three sectors to explode in the next crypto bull run, the reason you need to know about this company is because it falls under the one of the three sectors that we discussed, and that's privacy and security. That's right. So Mina Protocol is attempting to be the leaders in Web3 privacy and security. I like that. And you you mentioned something about Facebook and the privacy thing. That was your angle that you you recently said to me, which I think fits right in with Mina. Yeah. So basically Facebook has, so large corporations are removing the Facebook login due to privacy concerns. And Facebook has been caught up in privacy, breach of data, et cetera, for many years now. And the fact that large corporate, you know, when you sign onto a company website, it's like logging on Facebook, they're now starting to remove that button. Yeah, it makes sense. And that's where I saw a huge opportunity for a company like Mina because of the technology that they use. And it's something known as zero knowledge proofs. Um, we're going to be using zero knowledge throughout the episode a few times here. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we will be referring to it as ZK, so it's zero knowledge. So maybe you want to maybe let the audience know what a zero knowledge proof or a zero knowledge start snark is. Exactly. So zero knowledge when you're talking about blockchain basically means that you have access to the data without revealing the actual data itself. So when you're talking about vulnerable information, you know, your age, sex, location, ethnicity, all this kind of stuff, you want to be able to prove that data. Say if you're applying for a loan or a mortgage, you want to be able to prove that data without exposing that vulnerable information itself. And going along the lines of what we always say is that privacy and security is going to be a huge trend for crypto moving forward. A blockchain that is is building specifically this zero knowledge proof with ZK Snarks, like Mina Protocol, is worth this deep dive. Mm, Absolutely. And what's really interesting about this project and kind of ties into who you are as a Jolly Green investor is the size of the blockchain. It's so tiny. It's the world's lightest blockchain. It's you, you notice that right when you go on the website. So you go to Mina Protocol website. First thing you'll see, the whole blockchain, the entire blockchain, and this is kind of mind-blowing, is 22 kilobytes. To put that in a comparison with other blockchains, they're normally around 300 gigabytes and expanding. But Mina is 22 kilobytes and fixed at that size. So what that allows it to be is very sustainable, you're not, you know, uh, expending a lot of energy on transactions and, you know, ch- all, all of the stuff that's going on on the chain. It just, it fits in with that sustainability, renewable uh, narrative, which along with privacy and security, I think these are the coins that moving forward are going to win out in crypto. The ones that are scalable, sustainable, and private. Mm. And I'm such a dummy when it comes to understanding like computer stuff, when it comes to kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, etc. So... To put that into perspective, like how tiny this blockchain actually is, 22 kilobytes has been described as something like a couple tweets or the size of a Word document. It's basically nothing. Virtually nothing. And the fact that it stays at that size as it scales is incredible for its speed and many other things. So Yeah, so that's that's great right away. And then you you know who's been talking about zero knowledge a lot? Vitalik Buterin. Yeah, so he was just down at ETH Mexico. Um... This is a guy who created Ethereum at the age of 19. So when he speaks, you need to listen. And what I found really fascinating about watching him speak about um, down at ETH Mexico was his attention to ZK knowledge 
sorry, zero knowledge proofs, ZK snarks, and how powerful this technology is going to be moving forward. And who are we who are we looking at right now? The leaders in that space, Mina Protocol, for sure. So when you look at you know zero knowledge, all this kind of stuff, and we, we briefly went over the uh, use case about mortgage. You know, you're applying for a mortgage. You don't want to give away your vulnerable data, but you want to show the company that you are, you know, you qualify or you don't qualify. And that's just one example. But if you think about all the potential examples for a private, a privacy focused chain like Mina going forward, you think about, you know, COVID pandemic passports or things like healthcare or, or, or even, you know, along the lines of sustainability, carbon footprint tracking, you know, all these things that want to be tracked without revealing the customers, consumers, or businesses vulnerable data the the you know the use cases for me seem limitless because you know when if you have like third parties that are getting involved or somebody is interpreting the data you know they can they can provide you the loan they can make a judgment based off of your ethnicity your how old you are um, you know your source of income but the beautiful thing with this technology is the fact that you're just getting the proof of the data meaning that there's no subjective interpretation of who you are as an individual. And here's another uh, a great aspect about the fact that your data isn't exposed on chain. What if the chain is hacked or, or you know, the data is stolen? If your vulnerable data isn't on the chain, then you're actually, you know, your, your, your age, sex, location, ethnicity aren't being taken by the hackers. You know, they can't potentially perform identity theft. So it's just another one, one of those things that's protecting you as the user or consumer on that blockchain. And even though, you know, Mina still hasn't hit that, you know, real world adoption that we've seen, you know, in Ethereum and Solana, that's one of the reasons that we've been talking about it so much because we like to look for these early stage gems. You know, Mina only launched its token a year ago and it hasn't seen that real world adoption because they're building. They're building through the bear market. Again, we, we tweet about this all the time. Look for the projects that are building head down in a bear market. And for me, Mina fits that, that bill. And with the size of it, it does lead to re- real world utility. You know, when it is only 22 kilobytes, it's something that you can have on your phone and everybody can have a- access to it. And then the great thing about it is, isn't it one of the only protocols that can connect to websites? That's right. Right. So you, now you're having a web three application interacting with web two and does it, it goes through like the, the back door. Was it like the zero knowledge proofs? It can go, the, can go through the back door. So the website doesn't necessarily, necessarily know that you're attaching to it right so it's it's basically like you know chain link is an oracle right and oracle provides data from real world or web 2 to the blockchain web 3 but the thing about chain link is it needs the uh, permission of the website to get that data so if something happens if there's a conflict or whatever whatever occurs chain link might not have access to that data but because the oracle function of mina protocol is built different it can potentially get access to that data, which I think is one of the only oracles being built that has that function. So if you're, even if you're just comparing Mina to, uh, to Chainlink as an oracle, which, you know, it's not an oracle, it's a layer one blockchain, but it has this oracle feature. Um, because it privately interacts with the websites, it's verifying that real world data on chain. So again, there's just another um, set of real world use case scenarios for Mina judged by that technology. And, you know, Someone who's watching or listening to this episode, they're probably thinking, well, if Mina is the one having access to this data, are they not able to review it all and, you know, kind of be that subjective entity? Well, no, because Mina doesn't actually see or store the data at all. So the users actually stay in control of their data by keeping it on their local device. Mina only stores the proof of the data. Right. Right. So even from that perspective, Mina doesn't see it. I like it. I mean, it, that's why we said it at the start of this episode, there's so many things when you dig into what the technology is, the advantages it has over other chains. And we'll go back to um, what you just talked about with the Facebook login. So Mina, another potential use case for Mina is a private universal login. So like, you know, like MetaMask, it works all throughout the crypto ecosystem, connect your MetaMask, you're in, right? Mina has the capability to do the same thing across the entire internet. Right. When we move to a Web3 internet, because they have this private, again, it's all about private, right? So they can show your, your login details without exposing your actual details. So again, you know, when you look at real world use cases, uh, private universal login, 
potential for these Oracle features, um, you know, all these, these zero knowledge protecting data, which it's just, it's a trend that I'm all over. Uh, Mina just, it continues to tick boxes as you look into it. Yeah, I mean, when you have the Oracle power of link, you know, you're the world's lightest blockchain. You have security that is, you know, in some respects superior to Ethereum. Um, scalability, in some cases, superior to Matic. I mean, the fact, if you missed out on a Solana mm. or any, any, other, any of the other layer ones that have ripped to like $50 billion market caps, when this one's only sitting at what, $800 million market cap or so? Yep. I think this is an excellent layer one to really keep on your watch list. For sure. Especially with the real world utility. And, you know, now we can, let's talk about the comparison of Mina to the hottest name, well, in the space, which is Ethereum. Mm. You know, we just completed the Ethereum merge. It switched from proof of work to proof of stake. Proof of stake is inherently more environmentally friendly and sustainable than proof of work because it doesn't have the same mining, uh, you know, capability or function. So it's much lighter on the environment. But when you look at what's happened with Ethereum, the nodes and all that kind of stuff has become more centralized. But one thing when you look into Mina that's interesting is that every user is a full node. Right. And can connect peer to peer without the need for intermediaries. So it's like, you know what? Everyone can get involved as a node. I like that because on a lot of other uh, blockchains and layer ones, you need a lot to become a node. You know, a lot of money, uh, computing power, all that kind of thing. But if every person can do that in this peer to peer network, that's interesting. I saw something on Twitter today with something since the Ethereum merge and them switching to proof of stake. They've actually gone, I think, going from proof of work to proof of stake, something like 0.2% less, less electricity across the globe is now being utilized. Yeah, that's, I saw that. That's crazy. So, that's a lot. Yeah. So I kind of, I, I get where um, this ESG narrative is coming from. I understand, you know, how the government's kind of pushing this climate change aspect of, so the switch to POS, when you when you already are proof of stake, I mean, I think that's just where you have to be right now, right? And, and not only is Mina proof of stake, which is more sustainable than proof of work, but the zero knowledge part, I think makes it even more sustainable <clears throat> because it's, it's better for, you know, controlling data and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And because, so with it only being 22 kilobytes and proof of stake, it only requires verifying 22 kilobytes of data. So it's, it's almost instant as mm. well. And uh, one of the things that when you look at the MENA, uh, the, 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 the website, is you look at the venture capital firms and the companies that have funded MENA and are behind it. Coinbase Ventures, a bunch of basically any uh, crypto venture capital company that is worth anything is behind Mina. It was one of the most hyped launches, the IDO last year. The hype was massive. And, you know, as you would expect, like all crypto projects, you know, nothing against Mina, the token price tanked, mm. which is what happens with basically any IDO. Show me an IDO that doesn't tank, right? Yeah. And the hype has died. But that's what we do is we're looking at projects that aren't hyped, hidden gems, and one of the reasons that I like Mina so much is it never really ran during the last bull run. You know, I don't want to be buying Avalanche at the top. I don't want to be buying Near Protocol after a 400% pump. If you look at the Mina chart, that token price is low. Yeah. It's, it, it's you know, no one is really talking about Mina Protocol. From a risk reward perspective, and that is something that we try to do on this podcast frequently, is look for the best risk reward and why it is going to provide that. You know, when we do our, when we did our deep dive into like HBAR, for example, you know, it's the hash graph technology that we like so much. It's the fact that it's only a $1.5 billion market cap. And when you compare it to others in the space, how much more it can actually run when they have the right partners, the right use cases, you know, good tokenomics, the right team, the community, all these things put together, make an excellent risk reward uh, choice for an altcoin. For sure. And when you, when you talk about community, you can always get a gauge of community when you start tweeting about a company or a coin because you see the interaction with your tweets and right, stuff. Right. So certain coins have these engaged communities, which is always a great sign because they're fostering an organic community around the project. And Mina, again, it ticks that box. You know, I'm tweeting about Mina on the reg now and you can see the engagement. People are really passionate about this project. And, you know, after you look under the hood, like we've done over the past few minutes, you understand why. So when you see a community uh, of, of Mina holders that span the entire world, mm. they're going to these meetups, they're taking pictures, they're, they're spreading the word organically. It, that goes down to, you know, not even just crypto, any company, 
you know, you look at like a cult following like uh, Lululemon or Apple, you know, right. you have that passionate, engaged community following a company or coin or whatever it is. Take note of that project, especially something as early stage as Mina. You know, they haven't even really rolled out their real world use cases and they already have an engaged community. Yeah. I love that. It's, it's, and then, you know, you look at the roadmap. They've got so many things, you know, if, if you follow them, if you follow them on Twitter, in their Reddits or whatever, their Medium articles, they've got so many things that are coming because of, you know, they've got these zero knowledge bridges, zero knowledge decentralized apps, zero knowledge oracles, all of these different lines that their blockchain has in tech has so many potential real world use cases. So they're building out all this right now when no one's looking. That's what I like. Yeah. The fact that they're not spending any money on marketing, especially during this period of time, you know, we're in a bit of a bear market. You want teams who are developing and that's what they're doing. So when we get the Bitcoin having in 20, 2024, early 2024, that's going to be a time where these protocols and these blockchains the ones that have been building the most during that period of time are the ones that's going to absolutely rip, especially with a community that Mina has. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about finding hidden gem crypto projects and we, you know, we say, look for the same things. Look for the tech, look for the team, look for the roadmap, look for the community. And to me, Mina ticks all the boxes. And then you add that with the, what, what's gone on with the token. And when, when Mina was in early stage, I was like, you know, I, I get the hype. It's a really interesting project. But at that at point when it was launched, there weren't that many tokens in circulation. Now that it's you know over a year since launch, a lot more of the supply is in, in, in circulation. Right. So you don't have, again, the potential sell-offs that you would have for a newer project. Mm. So now as it matures as a coin, it becomes, again, more attractive for me to add to my portfolio. Yeah. And I know they have some really, what was it like some super boost staking rewards they have? It's mm. like 16 plus percent or something like that. Right. For staking Mina and uh, validating the network, so big incentives to get involved in the yeah, ecosystem, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah. When it's you know when you can do it from your phone or anybody can be a participant, I think it's definitely worth uh, investigating. Hundred percent. So you know when going back to just driving that point home, when you look at crypto projects that are sustainable, scalable, interoperable, and private, plus a strong team community and real world use cases coming at the yin yang. For me, you know, like I, I, I'm not sure I would put any other project other than Mina up at the top of the list. Yeah, no, it's definitely up there for me too, especially from a layer one perspective. So um, right now it's 88th ranked. Yep. So it's, it's just in the top 100. I think you said around 800 million market cap. So it's under a, under a billion. So, you know, it's a mid cap. It's not by no means a large cap, you know, not maybe a small cap, but it's in that zone. I think that's kind of like the golden zone where we like to find our gems. I mean, obviously we like small caps, but <laughs> when you're looking at, you know, between 500 million and a billion. Yeah. That's there's like, so many projects there that have massive potential to get up to, you know, that Solana, BNB, those like the big dogs. And, you know, for me, me and a protocol sitting under a billion market cap, that looks nice. Especially when you look at maybe on the stock market, for example, you look at other tech companies and what they're valued at. You know, you, some of these companies are valued, like they do nothing and they're at like a hundred billion, 10 billion, whatever. Yeah. You have all these crypto companies right now that are, actually paving the way for the future and they're sitting at these 500 million dollar market caps yeah and if you just have a, an ounce of patience you know a little bit of long-term thinking there's some really good projects out there that do sit at like this market cap mm. i mean it's definitely one of them so yeah i mean look if you want the truth about me protocol the truth is that it's gonna it's a coin that i'm dcaing into it's gonna be one of my long-term holds through the next bull market it ticks all the boxes sustainable private all that kind of stuff they got a great roadmap Token price looks good to me. I mean, if you want the truth about Mina Protocol is that I really like it. Yeah, me too. Hey, make sure you guys tune to the next episode. That one's going to be a banger. All views expressed by speakers on the Beanpod are solely their opinions. You should not treat any opinion expressed on the Beanpod as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a specific strategy, but only as an expression of their opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only.